Victor, while you got the floor, you uh, you had a couple of stories this week you want to talk about involving cybersecurity. You want to uh, tell us about sure. those? So yeah, for those of so for those of you, if you're in, if you're in a part of the country that's being affected by the gas pipe by the gas shortage, you know, sorry about that. Hope uh, hope that resolves itself soon. Um, you know, I I think I was in New York when Hurricane Sandy hit, and I think we we had a gas shortage for like a week, but everybody freaked out. So I can only imagine what it's like now with <laughs> with uh, an entire an entire region of the country that's 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 hoarding gas like it's toilet paper from a year ago. Um, but anyway. One thing I thought was interesting was just, you know, uh, the, the Biden administration released uh, what President Biden signed an executive order uh, regarding, um, you know, cybersecurity protocols and whatnot. And, you know, you're reading over, reading over it, it seems pretty, it seems pretty self, self, self-explanatory and you kind of wonder why they weren't doing this stuff before. Like they require, you know, it requires IT service providers to tell the government about breaches that could impact the U.S. network. Uh, it creates like standardized, standardized uh, rules and playbooks for, you um, the federal government to respond to whenever there's a cyber incident. Um, you know, it pushes the federal government to upgrade cloud services and things like that. And, you know, yeah, again, you kind of wonder why this stuff wasn't in play already. Um, it seems like it'd be a good thing for the, for the federal government, especially considering all the, all, the, all the cyber episodes that we've had over the last couple of years and whatnot. But then, you know, that kind of ties into the, the whole Jones Day, the fallout from the Jones Day hack that happened um, a few months ago. But this week it came out that like, especially here in Chicago, that there were some emails that got leaked that made our administration here look not not look so good <laughs> with regards to um, some police incidents that have happened. Um, you know, obviously the mayor came out and said that you know the emails were taken out of context and blah blah blah. Uh, and and you know, according to the according to Jones Day, like it wasn't it wasn't their actual it wasn't their actual server that got breached. It was like a third party uh, vendor that they used. But then that also raises more questions. Like, okay, well, why didn't you vet your? What did you not vet your third party? Uh, properly, you know, what kind of issues uh, are, are, you know, re- regard, you know, regarding your relationship with a, with a contractor or with a third party provider or things like that. So, and, and who knows, I mean, we were talking about this stuff earlier. Maybe, maybe this is why, maybe this is why law, lawyers and law firms are, are, might be afraid to like go to a full cloud model, even though it's not necessarily valid, but you know, you see these, you see these headlines and you see this kind of coverage in the press and you're like, well, I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want to get, in, I, don't, I don't want to deal with that. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to do what all, what's always worked for me. Yeah, of course, the ransomware stuff has nothing to do with going to a whether to go to a cloud model or not. But yeah, yeah somebody somebody raised with me today the question of what duties does a law firm have with respect to paying ransomware in order to prevent disclosure of client confidences, and I hadn't really thought about it. It's kind of an interesting sort of ethical dilemma. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it seems like paying ransomware, you just shouldn't, it's like kidnapping, you shouldn't do, but lots of people, lots of businesses do. But then on the other hand, I mean, there are, they are your clients' confidences. So this kind of could be a sticky issue, I guess. It's a fascinating question. There's a number of things associated. I mean, the Department of, the Treasury Department, I think it was, issued some new rulings that basically makes it a crime to pay certain people uh, ransom. Uh, so that gets factored into your patient. And then uh, I think it was Ars Technica had an article uh, that talked about the percentage of people that actually, once you paid the ransom, how many people, what percentage of people actually get 100% of what they, um, I forget the numbers, I think it was 17% got 50% of their data back uh, or unlocked. Uh, so if the, you pay the ransom, there's no guarantee, and you potentially get yourself in trouble with the Treasury Department. Right. So in addition to ethical concerns, there are legal concerns. Uh, I mean, I think Colonial, we, we all know the Colonial paid it, right? That, that was uh, said. I think they paid the ransom. But there was, you know, over the past year, there were a couple of very notorious cases of law firms that we've talked about the one here, the, the, sol- the law firm that represented many, uh, many celebrities uh, and uh, their uh, client documents were being posted on the on the dark web uh, for uh, all to see, and uh, I, I I don't know what came of that eventually, uh, but I'm suspecting that law firm probably ended up coughing up the uh, the ransom. Does anybody know what happened to that? Uh, no, but I do know that what they're starting to do is is um, au- auction the data off, which is a different problem altogether. Um, Jeff, you're nodding, obviously, which is so, and that kind of 
give makes you even more powerless right yeah. I mean because that means it, it's hugely valuable and so I, I find that kind of fascinating I don't know whether there was an auction involved in that particular case but Jeff you... yeah I've, I've read similar stories yes 